It was late in the afternoon on January 30th, 1945, when a group of guerrillas and scouts expertly guided a team of 121 United States Army Rangers through the rice fields to a Filipino campsite. The Rangers quietly went to ground and crawled with tremendous stealth and more than a little tension into position over the open ground that led to a compound. Four days earlier, guerrillas had reported to Lieutenant General Walter Kruger the exact location of more than 500 prisoners of war at the Kabanatuan POW camp. The men were among the few American POWs remaining in the Philippines, and the Japanese had held them back primarily because of their poor physical condition. (coughs) The Rangers traveled light. They carried only weapons and ammunition, and they wore soft caps instead of steel helmets. Overhead, a lone P-61 Black Widow fighter plane, piloted by Lieutenant Kenneth Schreiber, suddenly appeared. The plane, nicknamed Hard to Get, was there to provide a distraction to the Japanese guards. Schreiber circled some 500 feet above, diving and parrying, wheeling about, engaging in aerobatics that transfixed the Japanese whose initial fear of an aerial attack gave way to dumbfounded fascination. Meanwhile, the rangers crawled ever closer, undetected. Inside the camp, some of the prisoners watched the plane, just as absorbed as the Japanese. Many weeks before, the prisoners had jury-rigged a clandestine radio from which they learned of MacArthur's invasion and the approach of his armies. For days, they had heard the rumble of artillery and had seen many American fighters. They sensed that true liberation was at hand, though they knew nothing of the raid. With the onset of darkness, the rangers crept even closer. And at precisely 1944 hours, they opened fire and began their lightning attack. This scene, describing the raid at Kabanatuan, was a key moment in the battle against Japan in World War II. The freed prisoners were able to detail their poor conditions, and it led to increased vigor to defeat the Japanese. This description of the raid is abridged from the just-released book To the End of the Earth, the U.S. Army, and the Downfall of Japan, 1945, by author John McManus. The third in a trilogy that details the U.S. Army's role in the Pacific War, the fascinating book details the key generals and soldiers on both sides of the battle and really makes this historical clash come to life. Author John McManus joins us on today's episode to talk not only about the book, but the U.S. Army's role in the war, his own beginnings, which included sports broadcasting, and perhaps most importantly, hosts an impromptu pop quiz for our hosts. I'm Carrie varro and this is Army Matters. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Army Matters Podcast. I am your host, Sergeant Major of the Army, retired Dan Daly, and I am accompanied by my good friend and battle buddy, Lieutenant General Retired Les Smith. Sir, welcome to the studio. What's up, Dan Daly? Yes, everyone, I'm Lieutenant General Retired Leslie C. Smith, the former Army Inspector General. And I think I was number 66, uh, a couple more than than uh, SMAs. What do There's you think? There's a lot of Inspector Generals. Yeah, you know when we, st- we started? Right around the same time as the Army was founded. Yeah, but the, the Chiefs did too, and there's only like 37 of those. Yeah. Or 40. I, no, there's 40 I'm, I'm not going to debate that. That's not what the purpose of this podcast is today, man. <laughs> okay. So we got to make sure we stay on track. But we, we have a special person on the net today. We do have a special guest today, and he's a very accomplished gentleman. Yeah. You know, he's one of my favorite guys. You know what my favorite topic is? Yeah. It begins with a letter H, history. History. For all you history fans out there, this is going to be your episode. Obviously, not for less. He doesn't appreciate history. And today's guest likes to focus on the same time period that I do. Guess which one that is, Les? I don't know. You got to remind me, bro. World War II. Yeah. 
World War II. World War II. The, the greatest, greatest generation. generation. That's yeah, right. Yeah, a defining moment uh, on this planet, um, but also a defining moment for our military and our nation. So what do you think? We should bring John on. But hold on, before you do that, though, most of the time we don't get a chance to preview our guests before they come on the net, right? Mm -hmm. Last week he was in the Land Forces Pacific Conference and he just hit a home run. He did. And we're a big fan of his and he, he just did a phenomenal job last week. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Great so job. So let's tell our audience who we got. So our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is John McManus. He's an award-winning professor, historian, and a writer. And he's published 15 books over the years. Um, from U.S. Military History for Dummies, which I want to talk about today, um, to his latest book, To the End of the Earth, The U.S. Army and the Downfall of Japan, 1945, completes a trilogy on the U.S. Army in the Pacific War. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Sounds like I've come to the right place where history is welcome and love. I love it. I yeah. love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I awesome. love history. I can't get enough. Um, and we're making more every day, right? Yeah, that's the way it works. So we have a lot to talk about today. John, let's start with a book you wrote, perhaps one of your most important, perhaps one of the most important books in history, U.S. Military History for Dummies. What is that, John? What is that? That's just an overview of American military history from colonial through, well, what was present. It was published in 07. So again, more history has happened since then. And it's just kind of an introduction. Honestly, and I almost thought about assigning it to my military history students, except I didn't want them to think I was calling them dummies. You know, I teach U.S. military history, and there's so much of what I use in the class ends up in that book. And it's, it's just fascinating, all these kind of lively little vignettes and stories you can include. The only frustrating thing for me was what I couldn't include. Obviously, uh, it, it would have been like a 2,000-page book. So I want you to check our knowledge for me and Les. You know, we've both been in the military for a long time, so we got a little bit of military history background. That's for sure. My good co-host there, Leslie Smith, he's got a degree given to him by the United States Army. So he's educated. A couple of them. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right, give us a test, and then we'll decide a winner. Hmm. All right. Then uh, let me see, where do we begin with this? Uh, who succeeded... General William Westmoreland is commander of MACV in Vietnam. That's yours, Les. Oh, no, that's not fair. <laughs> so I know how this is going to go. So what happens, uh, uh, listeners, he says, oh, yeah, I'm a historian, but I can't answer that question. So go ahead, John. Who is it? So it's uh, General Creighton Abrams. Oh, oh I wow. Should, we should have known yes. that. We knew that. I mean, you guys know Creighton Abrams. It's just yeah, of that course. he's maybe not as well yeah. known in context, you know, because obviously the major wow. impact he had on the army and its reforms. Yeah. Okay. That's zero for less. Now get, give me one. Yeah. Give me something pretty easy. All right. Let's see what we got here. That's not fair. Go ahead and give me one yourself. I didn't even get the question. Okay. Yet, no, don't, it's my turn and I get to decide, decide when I'm going to give it to you. Thank okay. you very you, much. Are, it's my oh, question. we're doing pass okay. or take. All right. Okay, go ahead. That's, how, right. that's how, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, so it's your All turn right, again, Les? It's my turn. But I get to decide whether I want to answer it or give it to you. He Dan. can pass or answer. All right. All right. Name me the three primary uh, U.S. Army divisions that assaulted the Normandy beaches on D-Day. Wow. Let's see. You want to pass? First Infantry Division. Yep. Twenty uh, Fourth Infantry. I can't think of the third. The Fourth Infantry Division. Is that your final answer? F was it fourth? Okay. Okay. So you're going with what? Fourth Division. F he, Dan said the fourth. Mm -hmm. The fourth is correct, but the the twenty fourth is not correct. What's the second one? Twenty Ninth Infantry Division. Omaha Beach. Ah, out of New York. I mean, it's Virginia now, right? Virginia, Maryland. Yeah. 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 Virginia, Maryland. Okay. So it's zero for less. Okay. Dan, your turn. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm sticking with World War II here because, you know, that's our wheelhouse. Who commanded the 8th Army in World War II? I'll pass. Less. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger. I would have never got that. Ah, just right. we talked about that too. Uh, in my opinion, probably the finest U.S. ground commander in the war, not named Patton. But we don't talk about Eichelberger that much. Exactly. 
And that's uh, that's one of the things I tried to alleviate in the in that series I did about the Army in the Pacific because I think he's important yeah. on a lot of levels. Right. All right, John. Now that you proved you're way smarter than us, why don't you oh, tell no, me? No, that is not true at all. I would not say that. I just happen to know a few of these things. <laughs> I think our listeners already figured that out. You don't have to say it. But uh, John, tell us about yourself. You didn't always want to be a professor, right? You started off with a, a different life mission at first, correct? What really interested me the most was sports. And uh, so I, I went into sports broadcasting at the University of Missouri, and I was especially interested in becoming a baseball announcer. Um, of course, I always loved history, and I was always interested in World War II. It was funny because when I was an undergrad, that's what animated me, the idea of being close to sports and and being able to, to kind of talk and describe them and see the action unfold and be a part of that. I, I really loved that. Um, but, you know, as things turned out, I, I really liked my history classes a lot more. It took me a few years uh, until I decided, you know, I should probably go to grad school for history. And that would be a, a much, much better go. So you, you clearly are a St. Louis Cardinals fan. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Kind of an obnoxious uh, get a life St. Louis Cardinals fan. Yep. Have you ever been an announcer with those guys? Would you like to do that? Not with the St. Louis Cardinals, but when I was in graduate school, uh, so I, I went to uh, University of Tennessee to get my doctorate, and it's you know located in Knoxville, Tennessee. So they have a Double A baseball team there, and I was the the PA announcer for that team. It was called the uh, okay. the Knoxville Smokies. Now they're the Tennessee Smokies, and that was just that was a really a lot of fun. I have to say. Okay, okay, John, hold on. You have to give us an example of your announcing skills. Sure, I'll do my best. Let's see. Uh, Batting second, number 21, Shannon Stewart. There you go. That's pretty good. <laughs> and Shannon Stewart played many years in the major leagues with the Toronto Blue Jays. He was a heck of a player. That's pretty good. Not bad. Not bad at all. So, John, if you were to write a history book about sports, would it be about baseball or something else? I would have to say one of two things. Um, either a, like a modern history of the St. Louis Cardinals, which I, I think is just really quite fascinating on a lot of levels uh, or a history of professional or really major league baseball players in World War II. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a time when you have a lot of people who otherwise probably never would have been in uniform who end up in the armed forces. And of course, some of them paid a heavy price for that and, and were never quite the same. And, uh, and others, of course, went back to become great players or whatever, and we're really not known for the military service like Yogi Berra, uh, Warren Spahn. Uh, Ted Williams is a, is a bit better known because he was a pilot uh, in the Marine Corps, but you know he lost five years of his career uh, to military service. Speaking of World War II, you spent a lot of your career focusing on that era, and I know you got interested in it at a very young age. What sparked your interest? Was it a book, a toy, a film, or a show? You know, I mean, I grew up on that silly show, Hogan's Heroes, which in retrospect is so absurd. Yeah. Um, but but still, I, I will say this, uh, you know, Bob Crane, who played Colonel Hogan, was a, uh, actually a friend of my father's in in uh, at the, in college at St. Bonaventure's, believe it or not. And wow. So I had a little interest from, from that angle, but also just, you know, the movies at the time, like Midway, that the first Midway, not the more recent one, obviously, um, the big red one which I found to be a kind of an enthralling film on some levels for a kid. Um, looking back at it now, I, I you know would have some quibbles, but when you think about it, Sam Fuller is the main creative force behind that. And obviously he lived a lot of that history and, and that's shown through 12 o'clock high, uh, which I think still holds up as a, as a pretty interesting study of leadership under stress. Right. What about the show Rat Patrol? You remember that one? I do, but it was it was again it was a little before my time, and I I only vaguely saw it. Uh, I don't remember it having a big influence. But now that I know more about it, I think it's a pretty cool show. <laughs> we finally got him, Dan. Yeah, <laughs> something he had he didn't know about. Wow, yeah. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I at least knew about the show, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, but right. you didn't really me. know about Rap Patrol. Come yeah. on. <laughs> Let's talk about your 2020 book, Grunts, Inside the American Infantry Combat Experience. So talk about wh why did you decide to write that book? What, what made it so special? You know, I was heavily influenced by a book called The Face of Battle by John Keegan. Mm -hmm. You guys may have read that. We had to. Yeah. War College. You had to? Yeah. And it's, it's an amazing book. 
Mm -hmm. And and what really kind of germinated in my mind over many years was, you know, maybe we need an American face of battle, one that kind of focuses on modern U.S. military history. But the book also comes out of something that, that honestly is a major point of frustration and has been for most of my life, this sense that uh, our wars can be fought at distance through technology and that war can be about air power and sea power, economic power. And of course, all those things are crucially important. I'm not really arguing otherwise in grunts, but I am saying when we actually look at what happened, uh, most of the real fighting and the real dying and most of the decision points in war happen in ground warfare. And most of that in turn happens among uh, a very, very few of generally infantrymen, what we call grunts or whatever, but with obviously other combat arms too, but especially these guys who really pay the price. 90% of our deaths in war since World War II have been in ground fighting at a very time when ground soldiers and ground combat was supposed to become obsolete. So how could that be uh, when you've got nukes and all these other incredible weapons and whatnot? So uh, to me, it was, a, it was a plea for what I feel is sanity Major Samuel Woodfield has been referred to often as the most outstanding soldier of the First World War. In one battle, when his company came under fire, Woodfield took out several machine gun nests with a rifle, a pistol, and a nearby pickaxe to save the lives of many. And now, a USA has adapted his story for the Medal of Honor graphic novel series. AUSA is proud to announce the release of Medal of Honor Samuel Woodfield to detail the legend's exploits. The full color digital book created by veterans of the comic book industry and vetted by top historians will entertain and inspire those familiar with Woodfield's story, as well as those just hearing about it now. To read Medal of Honor Samuel Woodfield for free, go to ausa.org forward slash Woodfield. That's ausa.org forward slash Woodfield. So, John, of the 15 books that you publish, which one would you like to revise? Well, certainly Grunts, I guess, because unfortunately there's been you know okay. more fighting and more wars that have happened since I published it in 2010. Yeah. Actually, looking back, at, I did a, a, a kind of a two-volume history of the American experience in uh, D-Day in the Battle of Normandy. You know, that was about 20 years ago. And I think that I would probably approach that a little bit differently now. Um, when I was writing those books, I was also deep in the middle of, of uh, another project. And so when you're juggling like four books, you, know, <laughs> you can't always uh, you know, get as deep in the weeds research-wise as you, you would like. And so there's a lot of really neat sources that I, that I think I could have used and should have used looking back on it. I, I mean, I think the books are still terrific, but I'm biased, of course, but, uh, and, and they stand alone just fine. But if we're asking what I would perfect or change, I'd augment it a little bit with, uh, I think there's some really cool kind of con contemporary stuff, uh, about how the folks at the time saw the fighting and saw the battle of Normandy and D-Day that are, I think are really interesting. So John, let's talk about your latest book, the third in a trilogy about the U S army in the Pacific theater in world war two. Right. And I like that you focused on this because the movies would portray that the army fought in Europe and the Marine Corps and the Navy fought in the Pacific, right? What attracted you to the Pacific theater? I mean, it was really that because obviously a lot of it's been covered. For instance, I think the whole atomic bomb controversy had been kind of done to death. I don't know if there's a lot new to look at there. So you're always looking for something original. In my case, what interests me, of course, is um, soldiers and the human story. And uh, I've gotten, of course, more interested over time in, in the army as an institution and in senior level leadership and all that. Uh, and so as I thought about this, it just really, of course, it occurred to me that no one had really looked quite deeply into the army uh, and its role in the Pacific Asia War, which 
is just so vast as to be almost staggering. And, and I thought this needs to be done. So it's such a vast human story that it took three volumes. I probably could have done almost three times that many volumes uh, and, and still not covered the entire army experience. There's just this incredible multiplicity of missions that the army is juggling, like guerrilla operations and, and logistics and transportation and engineering, medical. I mean, on and on it goes. And, uh, and again, the human drama of it um, was just it's just off the scale. It's it's so fascinating. So, John, anyone who knows history about the Army knows about General Douglas MacArthur. Now, your trilogy shares some light on some things that the general public might not know. What did you learn about him in your research? Yeah, Douglas MacArthur is just endlessly fascinating and endlessly vexing, um, endlessly disturbing on some levels, uh, but also absorbing. Uh, so... You know, anybody who's, who's read the, the trilogy um, knows that I'm not a particular big fan of MacArthur, uh, but I try to be fair to him, too, um, and, and point out what I think that he, he did well, which is, for instance, I think by the end of the war, I don't know that you could find somebody who had a better grasp of the combination of air, sea, and amphibious operations uh, on that kind of scale. I think he's extraordinarily valorous at times especially during the Philippines campaign in 1945, almost recklessly so, that he's just, you know, he's running around in a Jeep at the front uh, all the time, and he's a theater commander. He's getting involved in, in like, platoon-sized uh, firefights. And what we don't admire, or what I don't, is, is the kind of conniving side, uh, the political side, where he's running for president, kind of sub rosa in 1943, trying to get the Republican nomination while he's an active-duty general in theater. He takes money from the uh, the Philippines government when uh, President Manuel Quezon offers him a big bonus. So there are moments like that where you, you kind of wonder what's going on with this guy. Uh, but, but I don't think any of us could dispute the intellect and certainly the courage. Uh, and, and I think to some extent, the impact that he, that he has on the war. That's good. Les is the army, former army IG. I don't think you can do anything like that today as a general officer. Could you, Les? No, not even close. <laughs> Neither can the SMA. I didn't, wouldn't think so. John, early in the show, you mentioned a General Eichelberger, and you focused on him quite a bit in your book. Could you tell us more about him? First of all, he's fascinating. I mean, he, <laughs> he's colorful. He leads from the front. He's courageous. Uh, he's, he's a soldier's dream in terms of relating to, to average soldiers and sort of putting them first. He's an historian's dream in the sense that uh, he, he writes to his beloved wife, Emma, twice a day, sometimes three times a day, even when he's in combat. Somehow he is able to do this. I don't know how. Shh. Hope my wife's not listening to this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. It put, puts you to shame, right? It's like, how could he do that? Um, <laughs> but he's also, I think, arguably the most successful American ground commander in theater, certainly, and arguably maybe in World War II, because, you know, he's basically at various times a corps commander, a de facto division commander, uh, and then eventually the commander of 8th Army, which of course still exists. And Eichelberger kind of turns 8th Army into the strong right arm of MacArthur's forces in terms of the nimbleness of amphibious operations, the coordination with other services. You just look at Eichelberger, how he, how he works, and you'd say, this is a guy who, who really grasps combined arms, inspirational human level leadership who grasps inter-service coordination. One of the reasons why the Allies were bogged down at Buna, Gona, and San Ananda in New Guinea in 1942 is the Australians and the Americans were not working well together. And it was really the Americans' fault more than anything. Eichelberger comes in there and completely repairs relationships with the Australian commanders, and they become friends, and they, they all of a sudden work well together. So right there, you see a really fascinating lesson of the importance of personalities. And I don't think that ever goes out of style, does it? I mean, that's humanity. And so when you study Eichelberger, I think you get a sense of successful leadership and, and how and why this particular guy can do that. And maybe there's some good lessons to learn. And plus, he's just, just really interesting uh, on, on a human level. You know, we recently just had a few guests, actually, to talk about the role of women in the military. And specifically, our last guest talked about the role of the women who ran, uh, were sent over to Europe um, to fix the male problem. Uh, and they got the Congressional Gold Medal as a result of that. Mm -hmm. But you talk about the women's impact in the Pacific theater, which I personally didn't know anything about. What role did women play in the Pacific? 
Yeah, there's two main roles that you see, of course, the which was sort of the traditional role on the cusp of World War II, which is healthcare professional, uh, primarily nurses from the Army Nurse Corps, though obviously the Navy had nurses as well. Uh, but there were many more Army nurses deployed. And, and the first example I'd give you is in 1941 and 42 in the campaign there, uh, the Japanese end up capturing about 90 plus of the these Army nurses who will then be POWs the rest of the war. Uh, and go through a very, very rough spell. Uh, fortunately, all of them survived, but most of them lost 25, 30 pounds and you know, a lot of adversity to deal with there. Of course, as we go forward, you see a, a kind of a much larger participation on the, on the healthcare side of uh, you know, field hospitals, general hospitals, station hospitals that have a very significant presence of women who are in just absolutely so valuable treating wounded, uh, dealing with morale issues. They're, of course, under gender pressures that are unique to them, trying to supervise male orderlies or whatever who are enlisted and their officers and whether the males will follow their lead, having to figure out their own leadership dynamic uh, among themselves, having to fend off uh, uh, social and sexual pressures, um, all of that too. And then you have the other role, Women's Army Corps. Uh, and that, that is the more populous group, especially by the time we get to the Philippines in 1945. There's some 5,000 uh, Women's Army Corps soldiers who are going to be part of MacArthur's forces in the Philippines. So they're doing um, administrative duties. They're doing postal work, just like the 6888. Some of them are mechanics. And that's interesting, too, because, um, you know, you got a lot of motor pools that need uh, vehicles maintained. Some were um, cryptanalysts. Uh, code breakers. Um, they were censoring letters. That's the other thing too. So it's just this incredible multiplicity of roles. And sometimes you might encounter the sharp end, a, a Japanese bombing raid, something like that. Uh, and of course, hospital ships too. Uh, there was combined army, Navy, uh, nursing units aboard some Navy hospital, uh, ships. And of course the kamikazes deliberately attacked them in the battle of Okinawa. Um, so the, it's absolutely crucial role uh, that women play. And I try, I really tried to bring that to life throughout all three of the books, but especially the last one, you really see the capstone of the large Women's Army Corps presence. What surprised you the most, John, when you did research? Obviously, writing books, especially of this nature, take extensive research. What surprised you the most? I was pleasantly surprised at the, uh, the large availability of some really interesting, compelling uh, Japanese sources in the English language. And the best example I could give you is translated diaries that Allied soldiers had captured. And of course, as you guys know, I'm interested in the average soldier. Uh, some of these guys kept really poignant, ultimately quite tragic accounts of their experiences. And you can really then kind of look at this at a human level and say, the Japanese soldier versus the American soldier, they're not that different on a lot of levels. And I think there's a good lesson there, too, uh, that this was a supposedly bitter, implacable enemy, and there's all the cultural and race hatred and all that going on on both sides. In the end, you see these supposedly bitter enemies become what is today good friends and partners. It makes you optimistic on some levels in, in that respect. So I really made it a priority to try and give the Japanese point of view so that you could kind of see what was going on on, on uh, both sides of the line. So, John, you just completed this, this great trilogy. What's next for you? So <laughs> what's next uh, is that I'm going to actually do a, a biography, like a wall-to-wall -wall biography of General Matthew Ridgway, who I think, just in my opinion, is outside of, I guess, Marshall, Eisenhower, maybe MacArthur, the most important American general of the 20th century. So consequential on a lot of levels. I mean, he pioneers the Airborne uh, and, of course, leads the 82nd Airborne in World War II and the 18th Airborne Corps. Um, he leads 8th Army in Korea. Uh, I don't know that we, if we searched in American military history, we would be hard-pressed to find uh, such a dramatic instance of an incredible turnaround that one commander was able to forge. I mean, truly one person. That doesn't happen all that often. Later, he succeeds MacArthur when Truman fires MacArthur uh, as theater commander. And after that, as if that weren't enough, Eisenhower, after the war, was the first NATO commander, you know, once NATO is established. And then eventually Ike goes and runs for president. So Ridgway succeeds him. And then once Ridgway is done with that job, he becomes Army Chief of Staff at a time when 
the, the viewpoint is, you know what, we can achieve our strategic and security games with air power and, and all this great technological stuff. And he's like, hey, the army's over here and, and it's still needed. And when you keep cutting my budget and then expanding my my responsibilities and missions, um, there's going to be a problem here. So he's fighting back for that. And I think he, more than anybody, influences the U.S. to stay out of Vietnam in 1954, so he's just on a, on a lot of levels, I think, a fascinating figure who I think deserves some serious coverage. OK, but is he fascinating enough to appear in the famous book, U.S. Military History for Dummies? He is. In he fact, is. Uh, I have him. Yep. Yep. At the back of the book, there's a, a, a part of it called the part of tens in which I have like top 10 um, movies Top 10 generals, top 10 worst generals, that kind of thing. So Ridgeway's among the top 10 best generals, just in my opinion. And who was the worst general? There were some bad ones, but there was, there was a guy, there was a guy named uh, Wilkinson who was like, this is like during the War of 1812, that era. And one of the things that makes him bad, he's not a good commander anyway, but he's also a traitor. Um, and so he's basically selling us out to the Spanish and to the French, anybody who's going to pay him. And I don't know about you guys. I think that's probably not the guy you want in charge. But um, <laughs> I think he's certainly among the worst in, in my view. Well, John, honestly, you're one of the best guests we've ever had, at least in top 10 lists of guests that have stumped less in military history and maybe perhaps myself. Well, unfortunately for our listeners out there, our time is up today. John, I can honestly say thank you for joining us today, but more importantly, for keeping the history of our military alive through your books, your lectures, and your talks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we appreciate you having been here on Army Matters. You're a smart guy, man. We had a lot of fun with you. Right back at you. I, I have my moments every now and again of lucidity, so I appreciate that. John McManus's latest book details a number of missions and treks. And in today's chapter spotlight, we'd like to point out a community march held this spring. On April 15th, the AUSA General Vesey chapter in Arden Hills, Minnesota, hosted the annual Norwegian foot march and trail run. Organized in partnership with the Norwegian Consulate and the University of Minnesota ROTC, the event provided an opportunity for U.S. soldiers to earn the Norwegian Foot March badge by loading their rucksacks with 25 pounds of non-perishable food donations and hiking 30 kilometers. 497 people took part, and proceeds from the event went to the chapter's Troops of Tomorrow initiative, along with donated food items directed to the Second Harvest Heartland. Congrats to everyone that took part in the hike. If you or your chapter would like to be profiled on the show, please email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Hua. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Army Matters is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission, educate, inform, and connect with the Total Army, our industry partners, and supporters of a strong national defense. Today's episode was hosted by Lieutenant General Retired Les Smith and SMA Retired Dan Daly, an anchor hosted by Carrie Barrow Heckes. Anthony Dale Call is the producer and writer and Andy Bosnack is the supervising sound editor. Unzinga Curry is the executive producer, and the senior producers are Carrie Barrow Heckes and LaSharon Duncan. Be sure to subscribe to Army Matters wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave a review. As you know, we love seeing stars in the Army, especially if it comes in the form of a five star review. AUSA's Army Matters podcast, primary purpose is to entertain. The podcast does not constitute advice or services. While guests are invited to listen, listeners, please note that you're not being provided professional advice from the podcast or the guest. The views and opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of AUSA. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. I'm with Sharon Duncan. Hope you have a great Army day. Hooah.